Thanks, Kathy. Um, so, good afternoon. Uh, Faye Benson, I work with Cooperative Extension out of Cortland County, and I've been working with the Cornell's uh, Risk Management education, education Team for a number of years, and uh, and I guess that's the first thing I usually like to just, you know, the information we give you um, is as complete as it can be, but it's a very complicated topic. Um, you know, farming is very complicated, crop insurance is very complicated, and it's, you know, an offshoot of the USDA, which is also very complicated. So your opportunity for disappointment is very high. The key to, to uh, being successful with crop insurance is having a good crop insurance agent. You know, go to um, RMA's website or ask a local farmer and look for an agent, you know, that'll listen to you and work with you. So with that, um, you know, so our topic today is about, you know, dairy risk management. Uh, we have Ron Robbins, who is uh, known for a number of years and has a lot of experience with it on his farm. And then we have Morgan Raymond, Rayberg, um, you know, coming from DFA um, and giving some additional information about the, the new um, dairy revenue protection uh, program. So with that, Ron, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thanks very much, Faye. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay and the voice sounds good. Um, I'm going to jump right in here and uh, um, see if we can't advance the slide here for some reason. Oh, no. <laughs> there we go. Um, hopefully didn't push too many buttons. So when I look at managing risk on, a, on our farm, um, hopefully today, you know, no matter what size farming operation you are, no matter what the makeup of the key components of your farming operation are, you can uh, pull or pluck something from this presentation today that you can use uh, to help you uh, maneuver through some of the uh, adversity that we're facing here uh, within the dairy industry in the Northeast. But I look at breaking uh, managing risk down into five key components. Uh, diversification uh, being one, um, and I guess when we talk about these individually, even if you're a, you know, a 60 cow dairy farm, uh, do you raise your own heifers? Uh, do you raise your own crops? Do you sell hay? Uh, what other things might you do on your farm uh, throughout the year that makes you somewhat diversified? And, and if you do those things, you really are diversified. They're all really separate enterprises when you break your farming operation down, no matter how big or how small you are. Managing price risks and marketing, um, you know, we think as farmers a lot of times that we don't have a lot of control over the prices of what we uh, produce and what we sell it for. But in reality, we actually do have some control over that. And there is a fair amount of tools out there uh, that you can use to establish, in some cases, a break-even price or uh, in other cases, a price that's going to return some level of profit back to the business. Throughout the year, you know, the, the markets give us those opportunities, uh, but we have to have our head in the game every day looking at, you know, what we can do to better manage that price risk on our farm. Crop insurance is, is a great tool and one I've been an advocate for for years in, in managing risk against things that we don't have control over like weather. And we'll get into that briefly here. Um, financial planning is a key component to everything I've talked about above. Understanding what it's costing you to run certain enterprises on your farm, what it's costing you to make a uh, 100 pounds of milk, what, it's cost, what it costs to grow an acre of corn, uh, what it costs to grow and harvest an acre of hay, uh, what it costs to raise replacements on your farm. It's just important that you think about budgeting and have good financial numbers on a monthly basis to, uh, to help you make good decisions. And then lastly, succession planning really involves thinking about the future and thinking about managing the risk against something happening to a key member of the farming operation. Somebody gets sick, uh, um, you know, God forbid somebody ends up dying. Um, how's the farming operation gonna go forward? Let's 
the, there we go. So our own farming operation, um, we are pretty diversified, um, fairly large scale. We milk 1,200 cows, raise our own replacements. Um, we farm a little over 7,000 acres, raising corn, soybeans, forages for the dairy, wheat, and uh, you know, use a lot of various techniques in our cropping operation like cover crops and other things to maximize yields. Uh, we do have a farm tour business that's uh, quite well recognized. We host somewhere between 35 and 45,000 visitors a year at, at the tourism business. And then we run a trucking entity that uh, not only hauls our own commodities that we produce on the farm, but works for other businesses, uh, hauling grain and milk throughout. The um, so we talk about, uh, you know, a key component of, of marketing and, and managing the data that, uh, that helps you make decisions on your farm um, and helps you achieve a price that's, that's certainly uh, can help you uh, better manage the financials of your farm, a break-even price, a, a profitable price. I break that down. I mean, there's, there's kind of a smorgasbord of things out there. Uh, you have forward contracting and hedging strategies. Certainly, as Faye said, they are complicated, but, but it's not something to be scared of. And it's, and it's something that, you know, can provide some unique benefits to a farming operation and taking advantage of volatility that exists in our markets today. As markets are based on a global uh, marketplace, we do see significant volatility uh, within a year's time frame, and in certain cases that volatility can be a benefit to the farming operation and locking in a, an attractive price. The government certainly has jumped in and, and put forth a, a menagerie of programs uh, to help farmers manage price risk. And like any government program, sometimes it takes time for them to, to tweak it and, and figure out uh, that changes need to be made to make it more attractive and appealing to farmers to uh, participate. And I'll talk briefly about them and then I think our second speaker is going to dive into a little more detail there. Um, having grain and forage storage, uh, knowing what's in that storage, uh, how much did you harvest, uh, how much are we losing due to shrink um, is important so that at the end of the year we know how much feed we have in storage and what we have uh, in place to uh, take to feed our animals and uh, knowing that we have enough forage without having to buy additional and if we do have to buy additional you know where's that going to come from it helps make those decisions that kind of goes hand in hand with inventory control and it also goes hand in hand with some certain precision ag uh, strategies uh, you know farms might think well i'm not big enough to use precision ag but things like yield monitors uh, guidance on tractors uh, can really play a role in helping a farm uh, maximize his yields and uh, maximize productivity uh, with what he's doing uh, in producing feed for his dairy. Uh, just back up there. This is a spreadsheet. It's just a quick snapshot of uh, a uh, spreadsheet that gives a little idea of some of my forward contracting and hedging strategies uh, this past year. Um, when I look at forward contracting uh, milk, for instance, we, ha we have to look at how milk is marketed. We have to look at what are the components that make up your milk price. Um, you know, we talk about class three and class four uh, prices, but in reality, Class three is made up of cheese and whey. Um, class four is made up of the butter and the non-fat dry milk portion. Um, and you can actually break those down. And in this case, as you can see, uh, for the first six months of 2018, I had sold 50,000 pounds of cheese uh, each month, which uh, correlates to 500,000 pounds of milk production per month at $1.63 a pound. And in reality, that turned out to be a really good hedge for me um, and returned uh, a decent return per hundredweight to the farm. 
Um, and I did that by looking at historic uh, prices for cheese, looked at the futures market and figured if I can take advantage of this cheese price, I can lock in a portion of my milk at a profit. We also did some target PPDs in the first half of the year. Um, and in the second half of the year, did some additional PPDs at a dollar. Um, turned out the last couple months of the year, uh, we had a negative hedge adjustment on those PPDs, but it was only on about a third of our milk production. So, uh, you know, all in all, uh, for the year, we balanced out in a, in a positive forward contracting position. Down at the bottom, you can see where, you know, uh, it gives total coverage for each month and expected milk production for the month. And this is just a tool as an example of what I use to kind of keep track of where I am and how much milk we're producing and, uh, and where my hedges stand against that milk production. There we go. Um, Government programs, we've had MPP, Margin Protection Program, for some time. It didn't work very well in the first three to four years. A lot of farmers got discouraged with it. Uh, those that stuck with it were able to gain some, uh, especially for the smaller farm operations. It really didn't work for larger scale operations, but they were able to realize some benefits of that program um, this past year. Uh, the new Devin Dairy Revenue Protection Program, uh, uh, our second speaker is going to talk quite a bit about that. That's, uh, that's new. Um, I think that's going to be very, very beneficial as uh, we go into 2019. It's really a program that's going to allow farmers to, to put a floor. Uh, it's basically a, a put option that's subsidized by the government, but it's going to allow them to establish a floor. So if we do have a catastrophic fall in milk prices, uh, they can protect a certain level and, uh, and collect accordingly. Um, livestock gross margin's been around a while. The problem with that is that it's only available on the last Friday of the month. And we all know we have a lot of volatility throughout a month. Uh, contrast that to dairy revenue protection where you basically have from the prices established at the close of the markets each day, you have till the next morning to go ahead and lock that price in so you can actually um, uh, take advantage of, of any day's market action uh, to lock in that price any day of the week, any day of the month. So uh, I think that's a big advantage there. And, and as we see, this back half of 2019 is showing significant uh, improvement over the first half of 19. I think dairy revenue protection is going to have some some real benefits uh, here early on to try to get some floors under that back half of this next year. <clears throat> Just a quick snapshot over the last uh, six years for me here in my forward contracting. Uh, 2013, uh, we realized a little over a dollar hundred weight positive in, in my risk man dairy risk management strategies. 2014, we, had, we left significant money on the table uh, to the tune of about $3.50 a hundredweight on all the milk we produced that year. Um, 2015, we, uh, we again realized about a dollar three, dollar four hundredweight um, positive margin. And 2016, about, uh, I believe 2016 was about uh, 88 cents. 2017 was, it's not on here, was about 44 cents. In 2018, we were just a little over six cents uh, to the positive for the year. So if you add all those up, and uh, this is a slide that goes back uh, the last uh, seven, excuse me here, jumping around here a little on me. Can you move that back, Kathy, one quick? Sorry about that. Try it again, Ron. Okay.
Well, um, anyway, that slide uh, that we missed showed basically over an eight year period, we were able to level out our milk price uh, by, uh, by forward contracting. And even with the great, the giant loss, the money we left on the table in 2014, um, we were able to, over an eight year period, establish a rather flat milk price uh, that took out all the volatility and all the ups and downs. And that's really the benefit of milk price risk management. You can see here in this slide with a bar chart, uh, three years of the blue is 2016 on a monthly basis. And this is after forward contracting, um, you know, looking at how we were, if you drew lines across there, basically we're, we're, we're leveling out the, the year's milk price the best we can. So let's see if we can go forward here again. Want to talk a little bit about inventory control and grain and forage storage. Um, you know, this is an area a lot of farms don't pay a lot of attention to. It's, uh, um, you know, when you're harvesting, whether it's grain or, or silage, uh, knowing first how much you harvest, but then how much of that's left to feed um, at the end of the year or throughout the year. And anything that ends up being thrown away is actually an expense to the business. So taking care of that inventory, knowing what's there, knowing what you've actually used of that inventory, what's left to finish out the year, helps you better uh, uh, take advantage of opportunities to, if you think you need to buy feed, when's the best time to do that, those kinds of things. And this is just a, uh, oh, jumped on me again. Um, there we go. Um, this is just a spreadsheet that I use that looks at harvested tons of our various components. And then we use TMR tracker on our mixer wagon to uh, know what we feed out each day. We record that, put it into the spreadsheet. And then at the end of the year, we can, we can see where we accurate in our numbers, the, what we thought we harvested. We know exactly what we fed out. We know what the ending balance is. Uh, and then we can establish some shrink levels uh, for that, that that gives us an idea of how much expense we actually incurred by harvesting feed that we ultimately didn't, weren't able to use. Uh, precision egg, um, just touch briefly on that. We talked about it earlier. That's an opportunity for farms to take advantage of new technology to, uh, to uh, know what they harvested using yield monitors and other things. Uh, just really uh, become a useful tool. Here's some of our uh, yield trend history for our farm. We can see in the top line being corn, uh, 2009 and 2016 were drought years. Um, but as you can see, you know, the variability certainly throughout the year based on weather and other things, but, but knowing these numbers, I feel is really important to, uh, running a successful farming operation. <clears throat> this is just a quick graph. This is 2017 corn yields. Um, and we look at this, our highest yielding corn that year came after hay. So after sod after a rye cover crop being the absolute highest, and then after wheat. So crop rotation, this kind of shows us that crop rotation provides a benefit. And this is uh, 2017 corn yields by planting date. As you can see, planting early paid off. It pays off every year and pays off quite significantly it happened to in this year so uh you know these are again other things that we use to just uh, gauge how are we doing and and what are we what kind of goals do we want to set for ourselves going into the year touch briefly on crop insurance um all kinds of things that you can use in crop insurance revenue protection uh being buy-up coverage uh, certainly has uh, unique um, advantages of protecting both against yield and price. 
um, utilizing optional units versus enterprise units on a farming operation gives you the chance if you have farms that are, are prone to drought or prone to too much rain, you can protect them on an optional basis, uh, prevented planting coverage where if you can't get in the field, you have some level of protection. Um, if you didn't get that crop planted, replant provisions and quality provisions. We had lanabomatoxin in New York this year and the quality, uh, and two years ago, a lot of vomitoxin in wheat and those quality provisions certainly provide some opportunity to, uh, to gain back some of what was lost from sales of wheat that didn't meet the quality standards that mills would like. Talk quickly about financial planning and budgeting, um, doing cash flows on a monthly basis, uh, establishing uh, budgets at the beginning of the year, and then using uh, monthly cash flows to gauge against your budget numbers. Gives you a good idea of where you are, you know, how are my cows producing versus how did I expect them to produce? What is my feed bill doing against what I expected it to do? What are my labor expenses doing? You know, it's just important to be able to gauge those on a monthly basis. We do that both for crops and dairy, as well as, you know, our other enterprises. And then a unique thing that, that we use, I, I actually put this spreadsheet together and I'd be more than happy to share it with anybody. I think Faye's gonna have my email later, but um, doing a margin over feed cost uh, calculation each month. So looking at what we fed to our dairy herd for the month, everything from corn silage, all the various forages right through to uh, dry cow grain, lactating grain. This is based on a on milking cows, even though it's what we um, use to feed all of the animals on the farm. So it takes it back on a per hundred weight basis for milking cows only. Puts a price for all of those various commodities each month. Then calculates milk production, um, what our gross milk sale was for the month. Um, calculates that on a per hundred weight basis. Then it calculates feed costs per hundred weight towards the bottom. And then this is November. That's what our margin over feed cost was for the month, $7.34. Certainly, we'd like to see that closer to $8.50 uh, for us to be able to make some money. But milk price is uh, not exactly uh, allowing that to happen. Um, but at least we're able then to, to track this. We can standardize it based on uh, a set milk price. We can graph it each month. We can kind of see where we're headed, uh, um, you know, with milk production and feed costs. And when feed costs begin to get out of line, we can look at what's causing that and where can we rein it, rein it in. Lastly, uh, just quickly, succession planning. Um, you know, I look at it as an ongoing process uh, for our business, something we we need to be thinking about all the time, utilizing various tools like land trusts to protect uh, uh, the farmland going into future generations, having a good attorney, a good accountant, um, making sure we have wills in place in, in case something happens and a family member passes away. Um, utilizing life insurance. There's a lot of great tools to utilize life insurance to protect against something catastrophic happening to a business partner or family member, and then finding ways to bring the next generation into the farming operation. And really, at the end of the day, succession planning uh, kind of, you know, I look at it as the umbrella over the top of everything else because, you know, without a solid foundation of good people, good strong family unit on the farm, um, you know, we're, we're going to struggle. So um, lastly, you know, I, it's a picture of our family here. Um, you know, every day I, I, I say to myself, you know, this farm is more than just land and crops. It's really a family's heritage and future and, and us as farm owners, what can we do to make sure we do as much possible to protect that family's heritage and future through some really turbulent times that we find ourselves in. 
So that's it, Faye. Um, so there weren't any questions on your part, but if people have questions, they can go ahead and put them into the chat box. Um, once we have Morgan's slides set up there, then she'll be able to uh, begin her talk. If you folks have um, questions for Ron, um, and while we're switching over, go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself or uh, and to, to ask him that. So Morgan, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. Um, thank you for taking the time to give us uh, some of your information today. Thank you. All right, let me just make sure I can navigate here. Guess I skipped past my first slide, but um, hello everyone. My name is Morgan Rayberg. I work on the DSA risk management team. So um, at Dairy Farmers of America, we have a team of individuals that help our members and internal DSA plants and customers manage their price risk. And so I work specifically with DSA members um, and recently I've expanded to be able to work with other producers, specifically on dairy revenue protection. So a lot of what I'll talk about today is this dairy revenue protection program, but first I wanted to uh, um, give a little perspective on the markets. Um, but before we kick off, I do want to make it clear that our team does not provide advice or consulting for our members or anyone that we work with. Um, we're here to educate and inform and help producers make the best decisions for their dairy. Um, just as Ron pointed out earlier, um, the markets in the second half of this year look not only to have significant improvements from the first half of this year, but to be relatively strong compared to what we've seen the past few years. Especially given where class four prices are, it looks like producers will, um, as of right now, have better milk prices in the second half of this year than they saw in the second half of 2017. So that's definitely a good sign. Um, and I know that it's provided more opportunities for the farmers that I work with than ever. And that comes with having more programs than ever to manage their price risk. So um, in the past few years, um, we've had this margin protection program Ron mentioned that in 2018, there were some significant changes to the margin protection program that made it more beneficial to producers who are using it. And I'll talk a little later in this presentation about the changes that came with the new farm bill um, that once the 2019 margin um, protection program, the new version is called dairy margin coverage, once that goes into effect, we'll offer even more opportunities there. Of course, the new Dairy Revenue Protection Program, um, which is a crop insurance program, has uh, caught a lot of interest from dairy farmers and will offer a new avenue for risk management strategies. The Livestock Growth Margin Program, I'm not going to touch on that today, but just know that that insurance program is also available um, through our team and through other crop insurance agents, still available. Um, it's been available for a while now. And then there are um, forward contracting programs that they're available to producers through their co-op, um, like DSA offers. That is always an option. And of course, producers can go directly um, to open a broker account and hedge through just trading commodities that relate to their milk price. And we're gonna talk mostly about dairy revenue protection today. Um, we worked a lot to educate producers on this new program because um, as was pointed out earlier, milk pricing is complicated and crop insurance is complicated. So bringing them together um, involves a lot of education. But at a very basic level, the Dairy Revenue Protection Program is a milk price hedge um, that helps protect a minimum price on the milk that you choose to cover. It's on a quarterly basis. So um, the up to the next four, um, sorry, five quarters out are available um, at most times, sometimes it can be um, like four quarters out in the future. And there's a premium cost associated with uh, purchasing this minimum, but it's got subsidized by the USDA. So this minimum price can be based off of class three or class four or a combination of the two. And a producer is able to enroll um, up to 100% of the volume that they think that they're going to produce in that time frame. They just need to be able to show later that they produced at least the volume that they enrolled in the program in the time frame that they enrolled. 
Now, when I say this is a minimum price program, I just want to go over the basics of a, a minimum price strategy for risk management. Essentially, a minimum price program comes with a premium cost and gives the producer complete upside potential above their minimum price level. So if markets move higher, they're just paying that premium cost and they're able to benefit with prices moving higher. However, the producer would be protected at that minimum price level. If prices move lower, there's some type of payment that would be paid to them to make up for that difference. With dairy revenue protection, the producer is able to choose a coverage level between 70 and 95% in 5% increments. What this coverage level really means is a percentage of the price available in the market in that quarter. So for an example, looking at where prices were end of day yesterday for third quarter, I estimated that, uh, so that average was about 1621 for the class three market. So we're gonna go through this hypothetical scenario of what if prices were available, because as um, most of you know, the government shutdown has impacted the availability of dairy revenue protection for the time being. But if prices were available yesterday, an estimate of the minimum price available for just a class three dairy revenue protection program for third quarter um, would be about 1540. And I get to that level by multiplying where prices settled yesterday for class three for third quarter by 95 percent. So 95 percent times that 1621 is giving me about 1540 as a minimum price level. To calculate the premium associated with that, USDA um, Risk Management Agency has a website that um, anyone can access that posts the actual prices. Um, the best estimate is the market value for um, purchasing that minimum for that time frame. And so just to estimate and, and go through this example, I'm gonna use a 32 cent premium for that 1540 minimum level that we talked about. Um, that would be my, um, our estimate of where the market cost um, or value of that minimum might be. I'm going to multiply that by 44% to represent the 44% government subsidy for that minimum level, which would be about 14 cents. So about 14 cents of the total value of that minimum uh, would be subsidized in this scenario by USDA. So the producer would be paying 18 cents for this coverage. And then the way that this program actually looks at revenue, so we have revenue in the name of this program, is a very simplified way. So it's not looking at specific factors on a producer's dairy. It's looking at the, nice, in this case, that 95% of the current price level in the time frame, and then the volume that the producer wants to protect. Those are the only factors it takes into account. So it's a very simplified view of revenue. And so in this case, we're going to use an example of a producer wanting to enroll 3 million pounds in the program for third quarter of this year. So a revenue guarantee is calculated at the beginning, which is simply the price that they're protecting, the 1540 minimum level, times that volume to um, protect an estimated revenue of $462,000. At the end of the quarter, if the final revenue is calculated higher than that revenue guarantee of $462,000, there will not be an indemnity. But if the final revenue is calculated lower than your revenue guarantee, your indemnity would be calculated by first calculating the final revenue and then finding the difference between the revenue guarantee and the final revenue. Essentially, if you protected a higher minimum level than where prices end up, you would be due a payment. So we're gonna assume that prices in the quarter that you purchased coverage for in this example ended up at 1505. To calculate final revenue, we're going to multiply 1505 times that same volume that was involved and then times the yield adjustment factor of one. We're gonna come back to this in a moment, but final revenue would be calculated by multiplying those together and coming up with 451,500 as the final revenue in this time frame. That level, the 451,500, would be compared to the revenue guarantee that you originally calculated. Now, one note on this yield adjustment factor. 
I'm using one as a simple example here, but what USDA would actually do is compare the expected milk production per cow for that quarter at the time that you purchased coverage with what the actual milk production per cow was in your area. That might be state or region, depending on where a producer is located. If the, if the actual milk production per cow is 1% higher than where the expected milk production per cow was, then it's going to increase this calculated final revenue by 1%. So that one is gonna to change to 1.01. .01. And it's gonna assume that on that dairy, they produced actually 1% more revenue than they expected. Now that could work in both ways to both make the final revenue look higher or lower on that specific dairy than it would have been otherwise. So just keep that in mind. For the purposes of this simple example, we're gonna keep it at one. And so in this example, we're gonna take that final, um, we're gonna take that final revenue and subtract it from the revenue guarantee to calculate an indemnity or the payment that the producer would receive after the quarter. So this would be paid out to the producer minus the premium um, following the final month of coverage. So if we're going through this example hypothetically for July through September of this year, um, the producer would owe premium after in the month after, so in October, and later they would be paid um, this indemnity if they were due one. So in this example, again, we're comparing the guarantee uh, level and the final revenue level to come up with the payment that would be owed to the producer. Now, we used a pretty simple example here. We talked about just protecting class three, but there are a lot of ways to customize your protect protection with this program. One way is to use the component pricing option where you declare your protein and butter fat percentages to match your dairy's produ um, production. You can also protect an average of class three and four prices. Uh, you choose a percentage of both, um, of both classes and it's gonna get a little closer to uh, the way that uh, most producers are paid. And then you can also choose a higher protection factor that can be chosen for a higher premium. A protection factor basically means that um, you can pay a higher premium to receive a higher indemnity in the case of an indemnity. So it doesn't change where your actual minimum level of protection is, but it changes the amount that you would be paid um, if there is one, knowing that you were paying a higher premium for that change. So that's, that's just something that um, can offer an additional factor if producers want to pay for it. Ultimately, this program provides that quarterly minimum and allows a producer to um, choose whether they, whether they want to base it off of class three, class four, combination of the two, or their specific component levels. They're able to protect how much of the current price they want to protect, how far, how far, um, how far below the current market prices they like um, to be able to protect themselves. And pricing estimates can come from crop insurance agents and these prices are available daily. So as was mentioned, after markets settle each day um, by 4 p.m. Central, prices should be posted to USDA's RMA website and available. And those price levels are available until 9 a.m. Central on the following business day. So producers have that window to contact a crop insurance agent um, to look at where prices are and to purchase coverage if they're interested. Again, this, would be, this will be available once the government um, is fully operational again. And then any indemnity payments would be pay, um, made in the following quarter. I also note there that premiums would be paid following the quarter that, uh, per, that you have protected. Before I move on to the MPP changes, I'll just give anyone an opportunity to share any questions they have on the Dairy Revenue Protection Program. Please feel free to shoot them into the chat box. I'll keep going for the sake of time, but I'm happy to go back to any questions on that. I did want us to talk about the Dairy Margin Coverage Program, which is the revised version of the Margin Protection Program for dairy in the new Farm Bill. As you may remember, for 2018, there were some good changes that were made to the Margin Protection Program for dairy that were very helpful to members in a tough pricing year. Now, we were talking about um, dairy 
the dairy um, protection as like a margin disaster price protection, um, and it protects a minimum margin. It's based on a margin calculation of mil the milk price, um, the all milk price specifically over national feed costs. And margins could be protected at 50 cent increments from $4 to $8. Um, there were additional, pr there were premiums above a $100 enrollment fee um, for anything above the $4 level. And producers were able to cover 25 to 90% of their historical production. Um, this was managed through FSA offices. So um, none of this would be done through like a group like ours. Um, but while we provide information on this program, producers would go to their local FSA office to sign up. And finally, enrollment would be um, once per year. Um, last year, enrollment actually was at the beginning of the year versus in the pr year prior um, due to these changes. This program has been changed to dairy margin coverage. So these changes incorporated into the new farm bill language uh, allow a few major benefits to members. Um, one thing is that this program can be used with the livestock growth margin program for dairy and dairy revenue protection and to be fair for contracts or other programs that you're using to manage your price risk. They extended the production coverage options um, from um, to 5 to 95 percent of your historical production. So you used to only be able to protect 25 to 90 percent. They widen that window on both sides so that you could really customize it to what fits your risk management plan. And, it, and here we're saying this tier one top coverage is at the 950 level. Basically, there are two different tiers of production. Um, the first 5 million pounds that you enroll in the program is under the first tier, tier one. And then beyond that is in tier two. And so tier one has highly, sub, um, highly subsidized premiums for the protection that you're getting. So um, being able to increase the top level of coverage um, by $1.50 is definitely beneficial to producers who are looking to use this coverage. They're able to get a higher level of protection there. And then if a dairy is producing more than 5 million pounds and wants to enroll more than 5 million pounds for the year, they can choose their um, tier one coverage at one level and decouple that with their tier two coverage. So anything above that 5 million pounds and choose a lower coverage level. So they aren't um, stuck paying with a high premium for anything that goes into tier two, just because they wanted to cover a high level for tier one production. And to give a sense of what this actually means, if you look over um, since the beginning of 2015, the chart here shows historical MPP dairy margins. Um, you'll see the green line representing the $8 level, and there were definitely times at which the prices fell below that level, and producers who purchased protection there. Um, benefited from the program. But now you can see how beneficial over the past few years the 950 protection level would have been. They also made some enhancements that offer a 25% reduction in premium for producers who enroll for the whole duration of the farm bill. And there's also a credit for any difference between the premiums paid and the benefits received since 2014 for MPP Dairy. So if you pay it in more than you receive for the program, you have the option to either benef um, benefit from having 75% of that total applied to future premiums or 50% cash refunds. And this new program comes with um, improved rates. So for that tier one of production, um, you have 15 cents as per hundredweight as the cost for the 950 margin level. Um, for comparison, last year, the $8 coverage level cost 14.2 cents per hundredweight. So you're paying less than a cent more for $1.50 more in protection. So I think that a lot of producers will um, be lo looking at this and considering it as an option for their risk management in 2019. Before I go into just other programs that are available very briefly, I do want to point out that, again, we don't know what the enrollment period is going to be for the margin um, protection program or the dairy margin coverage program for 2019. When we expect that to be announced once the FSA offices, um, once the government stack up and the FSA office are, are fully functional, so please look out for that information.
And finally, I just have a section on DFA forward contracts. I recognize that not everyone here either works with producers who are DFA members or is a DFA member. Um, that Ron, you know, did mention using forward contracting programs and to give kind of a high level idea of how that compares. Um, forward contracts, because you're allowed to lock in essentially current market prices, um, they can help protect profitability on farms, whereas, you know, minimum price level programs are going to offer a lower level of downside protection. Um, forward contracting programs um, can also be more flexible and in many cases easier to understand than these crop insurance programs or relating um, the dairy margin coverage program back to your milk price. They can be based on any variety of commodities and program types. And, you know, we have some managed through risk management. Other co-ops have them. And even if you don't have a forward contracting program available to you, farmers are able to open up a broker account and trade to protect their prices. At the end of the day, you know, there are more options than ever before for farmers to protect their price risk in 2019. And that's a good thing. And so, um, as you compare these programs, keep in mind that these government insurance programs, they are minimum price programs. Um, so in some cases, they're not going to be able to protect profitability on, their, on the businesses that are looking at them. But I, I will say that um, that's all going to be dependent on the market and other programs like forward contracting or if you hedge and broker account, those can help you support consistent profitability when prices are available because you'd be able to lock into prices. So um, as producers look at all these programs, I think the most important thing to look at is that they're all complementary, and producers are able to use multiple programs um, as they'd like to be able to come up with a more comprehensive risk management plan. With that, I'd like to just 